All right, let's get started. Um, in this session, we have two invited talks. Uh, the first one is by Sam Gershman, and he's going to tell us about the architecture of exploration. All right, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, so probably most of you know about the exploration exploitation trade-off, um, but I'm going to try to show you a new side of that today. I'm going to introduce some computational ideas about exploration that are a little bit different from the ones that uh, you may be familiar with. And then I'm gonna try to make the empirical case that uh, the human brain actually uses these more sophisticated uh, computational algorithms. And I, I would even go so far as to conjecture that uh, animal brains also use these algorithms. And I, I, I hope that by the end of this, I'll convince you that it's worth at least going and, and looking for these. All right, so just to briefly recap, what is the exploration exploitation trade-off? So, um, the reinforcement learning problem is to find a policy uh, that will maximize long-term reward, uh, and in order to do that, you need to explore your options in order to find the best policy. Uh, but you don't want to explore too much because that's going to incur an opportunity cost, uh, and so you have to figure out what's the optimal way to balance exploration and exploitation. Talk about uh, what's known as the multi-armed bandit that I'm sure many of you have seen before. And this is a simplified special case of the general explore exploit problem, that is the general reinforcement learning problem. Uh, so on this trial, we can think about it as, as comprising of uh, essentially just one state with a bunch of actions. Those that correspond to the arms. And on each trial, the agent is gonna choose an action from a fixed set and observe a reward drawn from some distribution. Um, and the multi-armed bandit has been important both in the, the machine learning literature and also in neuroscience and psychology as a kind of testbed for developing efficient algorithms. Now, uh, just a, a little anecdotal aside, uh, the mathematician Peter Whittle quipped that during World War II, um, the problem so sapped the energies and minds of allied analysts that the suggestion was made that the problem be dropped over Germany as the ultimate instrument of intellectual sabotage, right? So it gives you a, a flavor of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, and, and actually, uh, Peter Whittle goes on to say, um, he goes on to recount a conversation he had with a, a very eminent colleague, uh, and he told his colleague, what would you say if you were told um, that the multi-armed bandit problem had been solved? And his colleague said, sir, the multi-armed bandit problem is not of such a nature that it can be solved. Um, but so, so what Peter Whittle is referring to here is known as the Giddens Index, which um, took a while to kind of filter into the, um, uh, into the, the minds of people working on this problem. Um, and that is the optimal solution for the multi arm bandit problem. Uh, but the problem is that it requires a computationally expensive recursion, um, and it's also non-robust to variations of the problem formulation. And so that has stimulated many computer scientists uh, and statisticians to 
uh, embark on this quest to find more efficient um, and versatile algorithms for exploration um, that, that will approximately find the best solution uh, but aren't guaranteed to find the optimal solution. Um, and, and I'm going to classify these into two broad classes. Uh, one is the class of random exploration algorithms. And the idea here is that you're going to inject stochasticity into the policy, and that's going to force the policy to explore options um, that it wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, and then there are directed exploration algorithms that add some kind of bonus uh, to exploratory action values. So let's start with uh, the random class. Um, now, there is a kind of standard bread and butter um, policy that many, many people have used. It's called the softmax policy. Um, and the idea here is that you're tracking um, the, uh, the, the actions of each, uh, the values of each possible action. So I'm representing that by Q. So you've estimated that in some way, the, the average payoff for a particular action. Um, and then you're going to uh, enter that, you're going to exponentiate that value multiplied by some constant, beta, um, and then normalize it. And then you have a probability distribution over actions. And this coefficient beta, which is sometimes called the inverse temperature, um, is controlling the degree of stochasticity. So when beta is close to zero, you get a softmax distribution that's close to uniform. Um, and when beta uh, gets close to infinity, then you'll have a, um, a policy that is concentrated on the action with the maximum uh, value. And for the two alternative uh, choice scenario, this simplifies to what's known as the logistic sigmoid policy, which will be familiar to some of you as well. Um, uh, and we'll come back to this idea of the sigmoidal choice policies. Um, all right, so the first obvious question is, do people do something like this? Uh, and there was an influential paper by Nathaniel Daw that was published in 2006, which studied this question, um, both behaviorally and neurally. So he had people do the, um, this forearm bandit uh, in the scanner, and the, ar the values of these arms were drifting slowly over time, so people had to be continuously learning. Um, and he found that human uh, choices were most consistent with this softmax exploration. He did not find evidence for an uncertainty bonus. Um, and then uh, looking at his fMRI data, he categorized trials into exploratory and exploitative choices, the exploratory choices being the, the trials in which a subject chose an action which was um, uh, suboptimal according to the estimated value function. So that was a kind of model-based categorization of trials. And he found that on those trials, um, uh, frontopolar cortex was more activated uh, compared to ex um, explo exploitative trials. So this was a putative neural correlative exploration. This is the area of your brain that's activated more when you're exploring compared to when you're uh, exploiting, at least as determined by this model. Is this the whole story? Uh, well, there's a number of issues here. So one is that the, the, the DOS study, as influential as it was, it was underpowered by modern standards. There were only 14 subjects, so it might not have been able to detect directed exploration strategies. Um, and I'm going to show you later some evidence that there are, in fact, uh, directed exploration strategies in, in human choice. Um, and then another issue is that it didn't really consider more sophisticated exploration strategies, and it wasn't really designed to test those. So I'm going to talk soon about um, better experimental designs for answering this question. Uh, and then the, another methodological question is, how do we actually identify exploratory trials? So in the DAW study, the way that they did this is with a the model. They use the model to determine when you're exploring and when you're exploiting. Um, but of course, the validity of that depends on how much you believe the model. So is there a way to uh, do this model agnostically? Uh, and, and so that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so a very clever experimental design was developed many years ago by uh, Amos Tversky and Ward Edwards in the 1960s called the Observer Bet Task. And this task was basically forgotten for uh, half a century and then um, resurrected in the last few years by Danielle Navarro. And uh, my lab has start, uh, started studying it as well. So here's how it works. Uh, I, I'm just going to give you the implementation that we did. So you have two different lights, a red and a blue light. On uh, each trial, you can either observe or bet. So on an observe trial, uh, you, get to, uh, you get a random sample from the probability distributions over blue or red. And these are mutually exclusive. Um, so there's some, there's some Bernoulli probability of observing blue or red. Uh, uh, but you don't get rewarded for that outcome. Then on bet trials, you get to bet on which uh, light you think is going to light up. Um, but you don't get to actually observe what happens. You, you get paid uh, based on whether your bet was right or not at the end of the experiment but uh, you don't get online feedback. And so this perfectly separates explore and exploit trials, because when you observe, um, th that's kind of like a pure exploratory action. So we use this task in the scanner to try to identify regions that were um, more active on observed trials compared to bet trials. Uh, and we found two regions in particular uh, that showed this pattern, anterior insula and anterior cingulate cortex. 
Um, and so these are kind of candidate pure exp uh, exploratory um, correlates. Uh, and interestingly, we didn't find evidence for frontopolar cortex activation in this comparison. Now, the next question that I want to ask here is whether randomness is fixed. So I showed you the softmax policy with this coefficient beta, and typically that coefficient is fit to behavior, uh, and that's used to quantify a kind of individual difference measure of how random a person's policy is. Um, but what about within subject variation? Is there any? So if you just plot the probability of uh, choosing an option in a two alternative uh, forced choice task uh, as a function of the average reward difference between those two options, and these are for, um, this is in a case of a bandit with Gaussian payoffs, and those, uh, the, prob the parameters of those Gaussians are fixed across the experiment. Um, so you do see a, a approximately sigmoidal choice probability function, so that's good for the softmax policy. Um, but here's what happens when you split up, um, you, rec you recalculate this choice probability function for the first half of trials and the second half of trials, and one thing that you see is that on the second half of the trials, the, the slope is steeper than on the first half of the trials. So that already provides a clue that something else is going on here, that um, the choice stochasticity is not fixed across trials. So what is changing here? Um, and this is the point where I'd like to introduce an old algorithmic idea that has recently gained currency in the machine learning literature known as Thompson Sampson. You have to go all the way back to 1933 to actually the very first paper on uh, exploratory, approximate uh, exploration algorithms. And what Thompson proposed was very simple. So the idea is that you're going to track the posterior over each option's value. Uh, so you have a, a full distribution over the option values. Uh, and then on any given trial, you're going to sample a random draw from that distribution and then choose greedily with respect to that random sample. Uh, and in the case where you have a two-arm Gaussian bandit, this conveniently reduces to a Gaussian CDF, which is another uh, sigmoidal probability function that looks a lot like the logistic sigmoid. Uh, and again, it's, it's a function, a sigmoidal function of the difference in value between the two options. And again, you have this coefficient, but the critical difference here is that the coefficient now is a function of the posterior variances. Um, it's inversely related to what I'm going to call total uncertainty. So um, you're going to show greater choice stochasticity with higher total uncertainty. Uh, let me illustrate that for you here. So here are two distributions, or rather uh, two um, pairs of distributions. Uh, and in both pairs, the, the, the distributions for, uh, labeled one have the same mean, um, and the distributions for two have this, uh, label two have the same mean. But um, between these left and right distributions, um, the, the distribution for arm two has a different variance. So the softmax policy doesn't care about the variances, right? It only depends on the means. Um, but the Thompson sampling policy depends on the means, oh, sorry, on the variances. So in, in particular, in the, uh, the case of um, ARM2, you're going to have a wider variance. And so it, on the, it, for the ch choice set on the right side, you're going to um, have a, a shallower choice probability function. Uh, and so this can start to explain why we see changes from the first half of, the, the first half of trials to the second half of trials. Um, because as you learn more about the options, your uh, uh, posterior uncertainty is getting smaller, so your total uncertainty is getting smaller, and hence your uh, choice stochasticity, stochasticity should go down. Uh, and we can look at this more directly by taking the, um, the Thompson sampling model, tracking the total uncertainty over time, and splitting trials based on high or low total uncertainty, and indeed you see this uh, difference where trials in which there's high total uncertainty have a shallower choice probability function. Okay, so that's a, a form of uncertainty-based random exploration uh, in contrast to softmax, which is also a random exploration strategy but does not use uncertainty to guide exploration. Uh, so let's talk about directed exploration now. Um, so here, we, at least in its simplest form, we can devise a deterministic strategy where we an, attach an in information bonus or an uncertainty bonus to option values. So, um, and so one way to formalize this is as follows. This is sometimes known as a Bayesian upper confidence bound algorithm where you track, again, you're tracking your, me, your posterior means and variances, and what I'm going to do is add some fixed, uh, fixed constant to, sorry, not fixed constant, some constant that's based on my uh, posterior uncertainty to the action values uh, multiplied by this coefficient lambda that's a free parameter governing the exploration exploitation trade-off. Um, so here what really matters is not total uncertainty but relative uncertainty, um, the relative uncertainty between the, the arms. Um, and that's going to control not the slope, but the indifference point or intercept of the choice probability function. And that's illustrated here. 
So uh, in this case, you would predict uh, uh, the slopes would stay the same, but the intercept would shift over um, for this red banded. Um, now, as you can see here, there's a problem because um, the total and relative uncertainty are, are confounded in this example. But in fact, experimentally, we can deconfound these. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about uh, an experimental design which orthogonalizes these two forms of uncertainty. It's very simple. So we have, again, this two-arm bandit with Gaussian payoffs. Um, but uh, the arms are going to be, on a given trial, labeled safe or risky, S or R. Uh, so the only difference between these uh, arms, apart from their, their mean payoffs, is that the safe trials, you get a deterministic payoff. And in the reward trials, you get a payoff drawn from a, a Gaussian with some variance. Um, and this allows us to independently control um, the relative and total uncertainty by comparing trials in wh where, um, so for relative uncertainty, you can compare trials where one option is risky and one option is safe. And to um, get a total uncertainty, you can compare trials uh, where both options are risky or both options are safe. So those are trials in which relative uncertainty is held fixed, but we're manipulating total uncertainty. Um, so this is what it looks like in simulations where um, the choice probability function shifts over when you compare SR to RS conditions, um, whereas it, the slope changes for SS compared to RR conditions. And on the, those bottom panels are just showing you what I told you just now uh, verbally, which is that these different manipulations uh, orthogonally manipulate um, relative versus total uncertainty. Okay? So, that, so now we have a, a, a tool for checking whether uh, these different forms of uncertainty are uh, differentially affecting the slope versus the intercept of the uh, choice probability function. Um, so what I'm showing you here are the parametric estimates of the choice probability function for the intercept and slope. Here we're using a, um, a probit regression model. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but the po important point to take away here is that when we compare um, RS to SR, so that's where we're manipulating relative uncertainty, that induces a change in the intercept but not in the slope. And if we compare RR and SS trials where uh, we're changing uh, the total uncertainty but holding fixed the relative uncertainty, that induces a change in the slope uh, but not the intercept. Um, now we can get at this idea more directly by defining a, a, a joint model of the effects of directed and random exploration um, using a probit regression model where we have these three regressors, one corresponding to the difference in values, so that's unadorned by any uh, uncertainty. And then there's the relative uncertainty. And then there's the value normalized by the total uncertainty. And one can show that this is mathematically equivalent to a hybrid model of Thompson and UCB strategies. This is not the only possible hybridization, but this seems to be a relatively straightforward one that is able to capture our empirical results. So here are the results of that regression. So I'm just plotting the, those three regression coefficients. The differences between these dots don't matter. What matters here is whether they're significantly above 0. Uh, and indeed, they are. So, uh, both relative and the total uncertainty terms have coefficients that are greater than zero. And we can also make the same point by a model comparison to show that a model with all three of these terms um, beats out models with only a subset of those terms. So that's pretty strong evidence for uh, a, a hybrid model that combines relative and uh, total uncertainty in the way that's prescribed by um, a hybridization of directed and uh, random exploration. Another thing we can do with this data is look at response times. Um, so there, one idea that has become prominent in psychology is, is this notion that uh, value-driven choice is uh, governed by some kind of sequential sampling process where instead of perceptual evidence being accumulated over time, you have kind of value evidence accumulated over time. So you have integrators that are accumulating value signals. Um, and th to make a long story short, the key prediction that comes out of that is that res re response time should decrease with relative uncertainty and increase with total uncertainty. Um, and the reason is because if your, uh, if your drift rate of the evidence accumulator is e equal to, uh, it has a, is, is proportional to the value function plus some relative uncertainty bonus, um, then that's going to speed up the, the rate of evidence accumulation, make response times faster. But remember, the total uncertainty is actually entering into the denominator, so it's, so it's normalizing those value functions. And so a higher total uncertainty is going to slow down the drift rate, slow down the evidence accumulation, and make response times longer. And we see evidence for this. So if you look at just risky, uh, safe or safe risky trials, on trials where they choose the risky option over the safe option, they choose faster. So that's consistent with the idea that, that an uncertainty bonus is driving the accumulator. Um, but if you compare trials on which they choose 
sorry, if you compare risky, risky versus safe, safe trials, then people are actually slower on the risky, risky trials. And that's consistent with this idea that the total uncertainty is actually reducing the drift rate uh, and making response times slower. All right, so I want to come back to the neuroimaging literature. Uh, there's another influential study by uh, David Batter and Michael Frank and their colleagues where um, they try to separate the neural correlates of um, relative uncertainty and total uncertainty. Actually, they called it mean uncertainty, but it amounts to the same thing. Um, and they found a division of labor between RLPFC, which is very close to the frontopolar cortex that I was showing you before, um, RLPFC coding for relative uncertainty and DLPFC coding for total uncertainty. Um, but the, the interpreting these results is a little bit complicated because they, they actually separated their subjects into explorer groups and non-explorer groups. And even before doing that division, they only had 15 subjects. So it is still uh, rather underpowered. And probably the most important thing is that the study wasn't really designed to orthogonalize relative and total uncertainty. So they tend to be correlated in this kind of design. Um, so the obvious thing to do is take the risky safe bandit that I showed you before and run that in the scanner, which is what we did. And we did a much um, better powered study with 31 subjects. Um, and, and now we can look at the orthogonal correlates of relative and total uncertainty. Um, okay, so here's using the regions of interest that were generated by the batter study, the RLPFC and DLPFC. And indeed, we, we, we get this uh, a replication of their result. We also see some other areas that I had shown you before. So um, dorsal anterior cingulate shows up in the relative uncertainty uh, re regressor and anterior insula shows up in the total uncertainty regressor. So that, that might provide some insight into why those areas were showing up in our, our observer BET study. Um, another thing that we can do here is uh, ask the question whether variability in the neural signal coding these, um, uh, these different so forms of uncertainty predicts variability in behavior. So the way that we did this is we um, took these ROIs, we decoded on a trial by trial basis relative uncertainty or total uncertainty from the corresponding ROIs, and then we entered that decoded uncertainty back into the, choice, the behavioral choice probability model. And then we showed that this actually explains additional variance in choice probabilities that's justified by a model comparison. Um, so so th that uh, uh, fits with the argument that th there's variability in the, sig the neural signal that's actually predictive of choice behavior. Uh, and it doesn't work the other way around if you try to, for example, decode relative uncertainty for, from DLPFC or uh, total uncertainty from RLPFC. So you have, um, th there seems to be some functional dissociation there. Another thing that we can do here with, uh, is ask whether we can find some signature of the sampling process that's driving um, random exploration. Uh, so the first thing that we need to do is identify a value function and then ask whether the randomness of that value function, the, the, the neural correlate of that value function, is predictive of randomness and choice behavior. Um, and interestingly, the decision value uh, regressor showed up in motor cortex, which is, was surprising to us. But the critical thing here is that if you take the residuals of the uh, GLM that we use to model motor cortex um, as a function of decision value, um, the residual of that GLM is predictive of trial by trial changes in the square of total uncertainty, which you'll have to just trust me, that's the, the right algebraic correspondence. Um, so that, that's direct evidence that the neural coding of value is stochastically fluctuating, uh, not just purely randomly, but actually in lockstep with total uncertainty. Okay. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit more about uh, other applications that we've used this task for. Uh, so one uh, area in where um, uh, relative uncertainty has been studied before is in the role of dopamine genes. Uh, and in particular, Michael Frank has used um, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, particularly uh, Compton DARP32, to study uh, the effects of dopamine um, differences in, in dopamine genes on human behavior and reinforcement learning tasks. And in particular, in some of his past work, he showed that uh, Compt is predictive of this relative uncertainty uh, bonus that you get. Um, and we replicate that effect where we see that um, Compt is driving relative uncertainty. And then we actually get an effect on DARP32, which is driving um, or is correlated with total uncertainty. Um, and this is somewhat controversial, but, but the way that Michael Frank interprets um, the, the, uh, these different polymorphisms is that Compt is relatively specific to prefrontal dopamine and DARP32 is relatively specific to uh, striatal dopamine. 
Um, one can argue about that, but if you take that at face value, then um, the conclusion you would draw is that putatively higher prefrontal dopamine uh, increases directed exploration and putatively higher striatal dopamine uh, decreases random exploration. So, that, so we can just schematize it this way, that prefrontal dopamine is putatively uh, controlling the intercept and striatal dopamine is putatively controlling the slope. All right. So this is a super artificial laboratory task. Can we say anything about exploration in the real world? And I was lucky enough that in grad school, my office mate later became uh, the chief data scientist at Deliveroo, which is one of the world's largest um, online food delivery services. P people in the US don't really know about it, but if you're in the UK, you probably know about this. Um, and he basically just gave us a ton of data to look at, look at these questions. So these are um, the data from uh, to about 200,000 customers uh, across 30,000 restaurants in 200 cities, a, a total of um, one and a half million orders. Um, and what we, were, we did a lot of different analyses of this, but I'm gonna just show you a little bit of this. Where, so we were particularly interested in whether we could predict um, exploratory patterns where someone tries a new restaurant as a function of, um, of uncertainty. But of course, we don't have any direct measure of an individual's uncertainty, so what we tried to do is construct a proxy measure for uncertainty by looking at the variability of ratings for a particular restaurant and also um, calculating the average rating for a restaurant relative to the average rating within that cuisine type. So that's what's plotted on the x-axis, that, that relative rating, uh, average relative rating. So as you might expect, the probability of choosing this restaurant is going up with the, the average relative rating, but the critical thing is that when the variability is higher, um, people are more likely to choose that restaurant. So that would be at least um, conceptually consistent with uh, a, an uncertainty bonus directed exploration model. There are lots of other cool things that, uh, that I could tell you about this data. I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, but one thing that you can do is look at patterns of exploration in, within different uh, cuisine types and also as a function of prediction error, like whether someone um, thought that a restaurant was better or worse than expected. Um, and among the things that we found here that people are more likely to explore after a negative prediction error, uh, and that patterns of exploration tend to cluster within cuisine types. Okay. Um, now, um, Thompson sampling and UCB are examples of model-free exploration strategies uh, in the sense that they don't, they're not utilizing structured knowledge about the environment. Um, but people do utilize structured knowledge, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. So a nice and simple example of this comes from work by Bob Wilson where he used this, this another two-armed bandit task, but it was more carefully controlled in terms of what the subjects actually experienced but in a, a forced choice phase prior to getting a free choice phase. Um, and the critical manipulation that they did, which is different from most other studies, is that they told subjects about the planning horizon. So in, in some cases, subjects um, only got to choose a single time in the free choice phase, whereas in other cases, subjects only got to choose, um, oh, sorry, got to choose six times. So it was a, a horizon of length six. And they were focusing on the choice probabilities in um, the very first trial of the free choice phase in both of them. Um, and what they found was that the, um, that the choice probability functions were influenced by horizon. And in fact, both the intercept and the slope of these functions were uh, modulated by the horizon. Um, they didn't really have a normative explanation for why that would be. So it could be so the result of some uh, hybrid algorithm of the sort that I showed you. Um, but the critical point here, which goes beyond the kinds of algorithms that I showed you, is that um, uh, those algorithms don't use information about horizon. Uh, so we would need, in order to accommodate this kind of result, we would need to add in something more model-based into the exploratory computation. Okay. Um, the, the last part of my talk that I want to focus on is um, the what I call theory-based RL. And this is kind of the next generation of model-based RL algorithms. So usually when we talk about model-based uh, reinforcement learning, we're thinking about a kind of tabular state space where you have discrete states and you have a transition function between states and um, you have a reward function in each state and there are various kinds of standard model-based algorithms for optimizing, uh, for planning in those, th those uh, kinds of representations like uh, Monte Carlo tree search or dynamic programming. Um, Theory-based RL, has a different kind of representation there, um, and it's more natural for representing um, things like video games, um, which would have a very uh, uncompact representation if you try to do it with a tabular state space. 
Um, so in particular, we're, what, we're, what we're arguing is that people are acquiring program-like theories of complex domains like video games, um, and that these theories uh, f support a sophisticated form of um, object-oriented exploration, and that's what I'm gonna focus on today. So here's a schematic of the, the model that we've developed called Explore Model Plan, or EMPA agent. Um, and uh, the screenshot here is of Frostbite. So this is the, the sort of Atari game that, that we have applied our model to. And we've also built our own video games, and I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, so th the idea here is as follows. You get some pixels, and the, you first have to transduce the pixels into some kind of symbolic description consisting of objects and their relationships. So there's an agent that's standing on ice, and there's an agent that collides with a crab, and so on. And then from those um, uh, logical descript symbolic descriptions of a scene, then you can do uh, theory induction where you're trying to, um, re um, to invert the, a generative model that produce, a generative program that produced the gameplay experience. So the theory would correspond to something like what happens when an agent collides with a crab, he dies, and if he c collides with a fish, then he gets some points because he eats the fish and so on. Uh, and so once you have the theory, then you can do planning and exploration. You can use your theory as a simulator to ask what will happen when I do things in the future, uh, what rewards will I get, um, and you can also use your theory to construct intelligent exploration bonuses. For example, you can say that this is an object that I need to learn about. Um, and being able to pick out an object and say I need to learn about this object is rather different from the way that uh, we typically conceive of um, explore, exploit, um, trade-offs in environments where you're defining um, uh, values of, of options in like a multi-armed bandit where there's no real notion of objects, right? Th th there's no notion of a complex scene where you can pick out objects and selectively explore them. Um, so here's an example of, of the kinds of programs that we've developed, and I won't go into too much detail here, um, but the basic idea is that um, you have some sprite set that tells you about the agents or sprites in the environment. You have um, uh, termination conditions that tell you how to win. You have, um, the, the critically important thing is the interaction set that tells you the rules of the game, uh, what happens when different um, sprites interact with different objects, and you have a, a layout that you can specify. And then we can actually, we have a parser that we can feed this um, video game description language program into, and it will render a video game that is playable by humans or by a machine. Um, I'm gonna show you kind of a souped up illustration of this with nicer graphics, although m most of the experiments that we have, we have done in humans, we've tried to actually strip away all the semantic information because we don't want people bringing in a lot of uh, pre-existing knowledge. Uh, and that's, that's really with the aim of more fairly comparing against machine learning algorithms. So here's an example where, where you have some semantic information. So the avatar is at the bottom, um, and what you can see are different boxes that highlight um, objects that the agent wants to learn about. So it, it has some uncertainty about these objects. And you also see some objects with arrows pointing out of them, and those are the predicted dynamics of those objects. So the agent has learned a little bit about how these objects um, move, uh, and so it can predict, for example, that the cars are all most, or, or at least some of the cars are moving in the same direction. Um, but there's a bunch of things that it has no, no idea about, like what does the water do, or what does this goal sign do? Um, so then it gets a little, oh yeah, sorry, and one last thing, which is that the yellow arrows are, are plans. So these are, these are hypothetical plans that the, that the avatar is evaluating. Okay, so after a little bit more experience, it figures out, all right, all the cars are moving in one direction, cars are bad, don't run into cars, so I'm gonna avoid the cars, but I still need to learn more about what logs and water do, uh, so I'm gonna navigate to there. Um, and then I figured out that logs, you have to jump on them so you can, get to, uh, so you can avoid the water. <laughs> Uh, but I still don't know what this goal sign is. Let, let me explore there and, um, and learn about what it does. Um, and uh, so you can get the sense of how object-oriented knowledge is really critical in structuring the avatar's uh, exploratory policy. And one thing that you can do with this is once you've learned this kind of theory, you can generalize it to actually quite different layouts. Um, so for example, here's a layout that looks totally different. It has some familiar objects like um, the goal sign, the water, the logs, and so on. But there's also a new object uh, which is the fire, and the agent knows that it has to go and check out that fire and learn what it does. And, um, so again, it, it can invoke new exploratory bonuses even in levels where it has a lot of knowledge already. Um, so one of the things that we looked at uh, were, were the exploratory patterns in this agent, the EMPA uh, model, compared to humans and also compared to 
uh, a standard deep reinforced learning algorithm. This is DDQN, but we've done this with, with other kinds of deep reinforced learning algorithms. So the first thing you'll notice, uh, oh sorry, and I'll say that these are two different levels of a game. So you'll notice uh, in humans, they have fairly directed exploration algorithms in the sense that they're not just wandering all over the place, they see objects, they go to those objects and they try them out and see what happens. Um, and EMPA does that as well, so you can see that th there's very directed exploration that's object-oriented. Um, and you can compare that to DDQN, um, which is really kind of doing almost like a random walk, and, and that's because it doesn't have any representation of objects. There's no means by which the DDQN can pick out an object and say, I want to explore that object. Okay, so I'm going to uh, wrap up and leave time for questions. Um, all right. The, the, the key takeaway here is that human exploration is multifaceted and sophisticated. Um, and in particular, I've tried to argue that humans use uncertainty as well as structured knowledge to guide exploration. Uh, and that different forms of uncertainty are represented in distinct neural regions and they exert different effects on choice probability functions. So we can quanti quantify the differential roles of different forms of uncertainty as well as different forms of structured knowledge like object-oriented exploration bonuses. Now there's a bunch of open challenges. Um, so one which I invite you guys to consider is how much of this is true of non-human animals? I'm sure many of you will have the reaction that, well, maybe they have uncertainty bonuses, but they definitely don't you know, do the kind of um, um, theory-based exploration that we show in humans, but uh, you know, I would contend that they probably do something like that because I think that um, objects are primitive of vertebrate cognition just as they are, uh, of, of non-human vertebrate cognition just in the same way that they are of human cognition. Um, and then of course there's the question of circuit mechanisms. So how do we actually implement a biologically plausible model that executes these kinds of abstract algorithms? That's a very important question for future work. Um, okay, so I'd like to stop here and thank my, uh, all of my collaborators on this project um, and thank my funders and thank you for listening. Do we have some time for questions? All right, so I have a question, um, which is, um, you motivated these different uh, random exploration, directed exploration algorithms in model-free, in a model-free case, with uh, the, the problem that uh, the optimal solution is computationally not tractable. Mm -hmm. And my question is, how close are those actually to the optimal solution, if you yeah. know anything about this? Yeah. And do we need a variant of both, or is one actually better than the other, strictly speaking? Yeah, so, so uh, there has been a lot of theoretical work in machine learning on this question, and, and the general picture is that um, UCB, Bayesian UCB and um, Thompson sampling both enjoy logarithmic regret, which is basically what you want for an efficient exploration algorithm. So that tells you that, um, you know, within a logarithmic number of trials, you're going to um, get, you're going to, you're going to reach zero regret in that. Um, so that's sort of, that gives you a general sense of that. Okay, yeah, Ethan? Oh, oh, sorry. I don't know which, who is there. Thank you for the yeah. talk. Um, you didn't talk at all about uh, epsilon greedy kind of uh, uh, noise in the policy. Do you consider that purely noise or the most basic level of exploration? Yeah, so, so just so everyone's on the same page, epsilon greedy is basically like a lapse. So on epsilon, in, in softmax exploration, there's a kind of graceful degradation of exploration in the sense that if you don't choose the option with the highest value, you're more likely to choose the option with the second highest value than the third highest value. Whereas epsilon greedy, on some proportion of trials, you just um, sample uniformly from your actions. And I do think that epsilon greedy is a real thing in the sense that there are real lapses, right? Like when people have failures of attention and they might really choose from a uniform distribution. But I'm not sure that's a strategic exploration strategy. Um, that's just my opinion though. So, so yeah. one, of your, um, one of your graphs looked yeah. like it had, you know, was plateauing at asymptotes uh, that were way uh -huh. away from zero. Yeah. So that's why I was wondering. Oh, I see what um, you're saying. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that before. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah uh, that's a very interesting talk. Um, one of the, so you're, as you're describing, you're motivated by the fact that kind of the perfect optimal solution is very difficult to do. Um, for the ones that you've been considering, 
uh, have you tried models where the term uncertainty might be multidimensional so that you're still getting some part of the way toward that? In particular, I'm thinking of cases where maybe you're really certain one option has this value, and another one, you, the expected value is lower, but you're uncertain about it. Um, if you uh, represented more than just, say, the second uh, moment of this distribution, but also the skewness, you could say, is it uncertainty, but it's skewed that way, so I know it's definitely worse than this, or it's uncertainty, but it's skewed this way, so it still mm. might be worth exploring. Yeah, that's really interesting. We haven't studied anything like that, um, but but I like your example, because that, that illustrates why it would be a good idea to keep track of higher moments. Uh, yeah, I'd have to think about that more. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Yeah. So did I understood correctly that relative uncertainty always reduces the reaction time? Um, that is correct, yeah. But I would well, say I mean, I always, I mean, in like, this particular analysis, like yes. If yeah. I make a decision, if I have a, like evidence in favor of less uncertain thing, I would react faster. But if I have an evidence in favor of uncertain choice, I would react slower. I mean. Well, well the, the point here is that this is not going to be true of any kind of decision, right? Like this, I wouldn't claim this for perceptual decision making. This is particularly for the case where you have uncertainty bonuses to guide value-based decision making uh, in a reinforced learning task, where there is actually an explore-exploit trade-off. Um, whereas in a perceptual decision making task, at least in the standard ones, there is no explore exploit trade off. Um, so I, th I only, I, I want to restrict the scope of what I'm claiming. Here. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. So I have one more question while Luigi is setting up. Um, so uh, you talked about your model based planner, and it looked like, I mean, fa first of all, the tasks seem to be fairly complex for a computational algorithm, uh, so I assume uh, either you threw a lot of computational resources at it or you made some approximations. Yes. Uh, and if so you did, how does it compare to human performance? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah so, so what I didn't show you, I, I just showed you a little snippet of the results there, but one of the main objectives for that project was to show, for example, that when we compare learning curves for this model and humans, that they basically line up with each other. Uh, at least more than you, you'd see for a deep reinforced learning agent, and that is true. Um, so we, we tried to look at this from a few different angles, matching the learning curves, matching the exploration behavior, matching um, just specific patterns of generalization. Yeah. But did you use approximations in your inference algorithm and exploration algorithm? Oh yeah, absolutely, that's right, because it's totally intractable, right, so you have to. Uh, so the, the point here is not to say that um, people, the, the model is doing anything optimal, but rather that it's using more sophisticated approximations. So let's thank the speaker again. All right, our next speaker is Luigi Ma, uh, and he's going to tell us about human planning in large state spaces. Thank you very much. I thought I'd start with a brief introduction of my lab. So my lab works broadly in, in three areas, probabilistic computation with neural populations, uh, working memory and attention, and uh, the third one is planning in large state spaces, and I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, that third direction. Uh, so uh, the way that I talk about planning, uh, I mean uh, mental simulations of future. So individuals plan all the time, right? So you, when you navigate, trying to take the subway from A to B, you navigate career planning, uh, playing games, programming is even a planning task. Nations plan all the time, the New Deal, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, even I plan sometimes. So this is an email where I sent an, uh, to the lab where I try to plan a meeting for planning the projects on planning. So planning involves a sequence of decisions. So you go from state to state through actions, and you might get some rewards along the way. Uh, technically, this is called a mark of decision process. And there's nothing more to that. So what's, ha what's hard about planning? So a couple of things are hard. Uncertain rewards, uncertain state transitions, rewards are, that are too far into the future. But today, I'm going to talk about too many possible futures. So a little bit of uh, audience participation here. OK, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Where would you move if you're playing the X? Uh, raise your hand if you would play at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so a few people had five and lots of people had three. Both of them are actually winning moves. So if you, uh, if you play at five, then you, then you can force win like this because O cannot defend against both threats at the same time. So that was a planning problem. Was it wasn't crazy hard. How many possible futures were there to consider? Well, you had seven possibilities and six, five, four, etc. So that's a that's a pretty big number already. Of course, it's not exactly that many because some of these games would uh, end early. 
but what we're calculating here is something that's called the game tree size or game tree complexity. So it's the total number of possible games that can be played. And if you start tic-tac-toe with an empty board, then the game tree size is 27,000. Uh, now, the state space complexity, that's another measure of complexity of a game. Uh, that's the total number of possible game positions uh, that are allowed by the rules. Tic-tac-toe, apart from symmetries, uh, etc., it's uh, 765. Now, that's a 3x3 three three board. Right? You can imagine that if you increase the board size, you get a combinatorial explosion of both measures of complexity. There are too many possibilities. Uh, this is a really extreme example. If you were to play Go, you start with an empty board, 361 possibilities, a crazy number here. So this reminds you of Borges' uh, uh, The Garden of Forking Path. It's a short story. Uh, I re really recommend it. This was one of my favorite books in graduate school. Who knows this book? OK, so it's, it's written by mathematicians who essentially did recreational mathematics, which is they solved uh, games that people play. Um, but combinatorial hard planning problems can actually rarely be solved. So that's where computer scientists come in. They try to find better and better algorithms for such combinatorially hard planning problems. So we heard Matt talk about all these um, uh, high-profile covers where deep reinforcement learning so it can solve very uh, complex planning problems such as Go. But I'm going to argue that they are not good models of human planning. So why not? Well, there are two main reasons. They're superhuman and they're subhuman. So what do I mean by that? So superhuman, that was actually not meant as a joke. Right? Uh, so <laughs> in Go, uh, of course, one of the triumphs was that AlphaGo uh, defeat, uh, defeated the uh, world champion in Go. In chess, uh, number two here is on the computer chess ranking list. It's uh, LC0, which is pretty much like Alpha0. And uh, as a comparison, all of these uh, uh, computer chess programs, some of which are deep, deeper and some of which are not, they would uh, completely own the world champion in chess, Magnus Carlsen, the same way that the world champion would own me if I were to play against him. So this is really uh, very impressive from an artificial intelligence point of view. But at the same time, you would also think that the fact that it's superhuman means that they do something different than human, right? So uh, that, that's already the first clue that it's not uh, the same as what people do in, in similar, similar tasks. Now, subhuman is if you start looking into the supplementary material. So uh, this is actually from a, from a slide. Uh, so alpha zero uh, considers 10 thousands of moves per decision, whereas a human grandmaster on the left here is hundreds of moves. So they already pretty much say that this is not as exactly like humans uh, uh, evaluate chess positions. And then uh, this is re the real bummer. So if you look at the number of training games, Alpha Zero uh, needed 44 million uh, training games in chess. So as we hear from Sam, it's actually hard to um, think of conceptual knowledge and to convey through a language, but it's at least a very different way in which uh, humans learn to play chess than um, uh, these machines. So I'd like to argue that they're not good models of human planning, and they were actually never meant to be. Right? So the goal of AI is to build better performing machines, not necessarily to understand human intelligence. So if you're in computational cognitive science like me, then that is exactly your goal, to understand human intelligence, to best mimic human animal behavior, and uh, not optimizing performance. We don't particularly care about that. Now, we, we do this by using tasks that are challenging for humans. So at this point, I, th I thought I'd throw in some uh, free life advice. So this is Creed for a Happy Life. So I believe in human cognition. I think this uh, you do too, because nobody, literally nobody, uh, wrote in their personal statements, as long as I can remember, I have been fascinated by mouse intelligence. <laughs> So uh, this is not uh, to detract from the importance of animal models, but at cosine, this balance is off. And that's not the organizer's fault, because they have to draw from what you submit. So my uh, recommendation is, uh, please expand your research to include human cognition. Uh, so what do people do in, in terms of human planning? So they, they use uh, planning tasks. Like these are some really famous ones, like uh, the Nathaniel Doss task, uh, two-step task is uh, B. Uh, Quentin House task is G, Fred Calloway's task is, is F. Uh, we summarize this in this research, in this review paper. But what they have in common is that they are still relatively simple tasks. You see, they go maybe two or three levels deep, right? So you have to think two or three uh, moves ahead. So uh, E is a little bit of a special case. Uh, that actually can be expanded to, uh, to 12 levels. But the, it's still not comp comparable to the problems that artificial intelligence researchers are trying to tackle. So I thought I sketched this out in the space of planning task. So x-axis is complexity of a planning task, y-axis is potential for understanding, and you can uh, think, uh, you can discuss at length about what you mean exactly by that. 
so the real world is probably somewhere in there, right? It's very complex, it's very difficult to understand. AI is trying to solve complex problems, really complex, challenging, real world, real world type problems uh, outperforming humans uh, in, in the process. Cognitive science and neuroscience, they have a reductionist tendency. So uh, if they have a choice, they choose simple tasks and they build very precise models. So the question that I'm going to ask here is, is there a fruitful uh, space in between? So can we push the tasks that cognitive scientists and neuroscientists use to understand uh, planning to more interesting, more complex tasks. So we are looking for a combinatorial planning task of intermediate complexity that still retains the potential for modeling. So the game that we came up with is uh, pretty much a generalization of tic-tac-toe. So your job is to connect four in a row on a four by nine board. Right? So that's, that's pretty much the only instruction that our subjects get. Uh, this is not connect four because the pieces don't drop. So we're hoping to argue that uh, that is a task that, uh, that is uh, com in of interesting complexity and at the same time still tractable. The number of legal positions in this game, so the state space complexity is 10 to the 16. It's many fewer than chess, it's many more than tic-tac-toe, so hopefully it can strike this balance between uh, complexity and potential for understanding. So here you see uh, a game between two novice players. So they pretty much got the instructions that you just got and uh, they're playing the game. And I hope you can take two things away from this. One is that uh, this is considerably more complex than tic-tac-toe. At the same time, people seem to have sensible intuitions on how to play this game. And they uh, actually do pretty well on their, even on their first try. Uh, so, a uh, second piece of life advice. So, I, I believe in the detailed characterization of human cognition. So, not something crude like total reward or accuracy or playing strength, which is sometimes uh, something that in uh, the AI literature is, is, um, is ov overdone. So, uh, I, I put it in extra big font, what I mean here. So, we want to predict what move a particular individual makes would make in a particular position. So, it's, it's a pretty ambitious goal. Uh, the tasks that our subjects uh, 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 performed in the lab, there were six of them. Uh, for example, they played against other humans, they played against uh, artificial intelligence opponents. Um, that's not even on here. Then they uh, chose between two moves on a, in a given position, and they evaluated the given position, and there were a couple of others. So uh, Bas van der Peusen led this work. Zaghi, Yunchi, and, and Jenny did, did important part of it, parts of it. So now that we have this task, can we build a cognitive process of uh, human behavior? So I'm going to let myself be inspired by old-style AI, so pre-deep learning. And, and when I say old, I mean very old. So this is 1950. Claude Shannon, also the father of information theory, wrote this article about how to program a computer for playing chess. This is 1950, so this is a theoretical paper. So he had two key ingredients uh, that are still being used. One is the evaluation function. Since you cannot uh, evaluate uh, everything that's going to happen from the current position until the very end, you need to stop at some point, and then you have to evaluate the point that this position that you have there. So you need an evaluation function, a recipe for quantifying how good a position is for you. Then you also need a selective search strategy. Because of this combinatorial explosion of possibilities, you have to be very, very selective in what is the next move that you're trying to go evaluate. Does it make sense? All right, so in our task, what, uh, what form do, do these two ingredients take? So we, we made up plausible features, and those features would be, uh, you can think of them as sub-goals that the agent is trying to achieve. So the uh, ultimate goal is to make four in a row. So on the way to four in a row, you have to get three in a row somewhere. So we call those features. Uh, two in a row with, uh, two, with empty squares surrounding the two uh, so that it's possible to make four in a row, those are other features. For example, the, the, the blue line uh, uh, connects, uh, indicates one of those features. So a feature is a pattern that can be completed to four in a row. And then we also had a centrality feature uh, because it's generally better to sp uh, start in the, in the center of the game and work your way out because you have more space in the center. So uh, the, those first type of features can be counted. So the patterns can be counted how often they occur anywhere on the board in any, any orientation. Uh, so then you weight some of those features more than others because a three in a row is obviously more valuable than a two in a row. And then the value function, the first key ingredient, is the difference between the weighted feature counts of oneself and one's opponent. Uh, the equation pretty much uh, says that. Okay? So here's key ingredient number two. This is a selective search. So uh, it is an iterative algorithm. It's called best first search. It's, it's very similar to best first search. The first step is that you identify the current move options. Then you evaluate the resulting positions using that evaluation function that we just defined. Then you backpropagate the highest value for your own moves and the lowest value for your opponent moves because your opponent is trying to minimize the value for you. Right? So they, you backpropagate that all the way to the, to the current position. 
and then you go down the sequence of the best move until you end, uh, uh, until you st uh, end with a particular uh, position that you have not evaluated yet, uh, that you have uh, evaluated but not expanded yet, and then you go back to one where you consider the options that you would have in that position. Okay. So uh, here's uh, uh, how this model thinks ahead. Uh, so what you see in the bottom is uh, the one, two, three, four, et cetera, is going to be the sequence of moves. So here it has decided on uh, uh, the first move to make. Then it's uh, uh, choosing a, se a second move for the opponent. It's not a particularly good move. It discovers that and then considers a different second move for the opponent. Uh, then it's uh, playing with the third move for you, for the black player, and it, it evol evolves like this. Uh, until, and as you can see, the principal variation, so the sequence of best moves changes all the time until in the end uh, it settles and a decision is reached. Okay, so uh, there's some other components to this model that I haven't told you about yet. So one is that you need some kind of pruning. So even on a four by nine board, there's still 36 possibilities, uh, at least at the beginning. So you have to do some pruning that you cannot consider evaluate everything. And then we have to make this uh, uh, more human-like, so you have to build in different for uh, for forms of noise. So there's value function noise, which is actually very similar to uh, the softmax noise that Simon was just uh, talking about. Uh, feature dropping, uh, that is uh, the sort of an attentional factor where sometimes you just overlook something. Your opponent makes a three in a row, and you don't notice it, and you play somewhere else. So that's an attentional drop. And then with a small probability, uh, the mo model makes a random move, so that's similar to what was previously meant, uh, the epsilon, epsilon greedy, so that's just a generic lapse. And then we need a, a termination criterion. You cannot keep going forever. Uh, we have a random uh, termination, and in, a in addition to that, we have a rule that if the best move hasn't changed for a while, where a while is a free parameter, then you uh, stop and you just make that move. Obtaining model predictions. So I showed you one simulation that gave rise to a single decision. But because of all those sources of noise, you have to run that simulation many, many times. So in the end, you get a histogram over the, uh, over the moves that the subject could make in that position. Right? So for each square, it would assign a pro probability. Now, fitting this model to human moves is actually hard. It's not uh, uh, like your typical 2AFC uh, uh, task. The model has nine free parameters, uh, and we fit the parameters to gameplay of individual subjects using maximum likelihood estimation. One of the difficulties is that we have to obtain the model predictions using simulation. And another one is that we have, um, uh, like so many options in each uh, position, that sometimes it's really hard to establish the log likelihood of the, of the subject's move. We cross-validate everything. So this is a giant parenthesis because I want to see who, how, how many of you want to know the details of the model fitting. It's a, a bit geeky, it's not too hard, but it takes, uh, it takes a minute. So raise your hand if you want to know the technical details of the model fitting. Okay, raise your hand if you, if you absolutely do not want those. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I think the yes are in the minority. majority. You just uh, uh, take a break if, if you said no. So the challenges in fitting the model. Uh, one is that log likelihoods are based on simulations. So if you uh, simulate, let's say, always a thousand times in each, posi each position, that uh, turns out to introduce biases. I was never aware of that until L Luigi, who's in the audience there, uh, told me about it. And it turns out there's a fix for that. So uh, there's a method called inverse binomial sampling that gives you an un uniformly unbiased and minimum variance estimator of the log likelihood based on samples. And uh, check out their uh, preprint, uh, Bas uh, Bus and Luigi's preprint, to, uh, to see the details. Now, the second challenge is that the log likelihood and landscape is not, not smooth. So uh, the, there is um, simulation, it's simulation based, so there's always going to be uh, a lot of noise on your la landscape. So gradient based mo models uh, really s struggles. Uh, direct search model uh, methods such as uh, pattern search are very primitive. So uh, Luigi uh, also developed a method for uh, solving that problem where he takes the best of the direct search models but makes it more Bayesian. And that turns out to outperform lots of established models in and uh, in um, lots of complicated optimization tasks. Uh, Luigi, I think, is also starting to be on the job market, so if you want to offer him a job, please go ahead. Um, the third problem that we have to deal with is um, we uh, have a dependence on initial conditions, so you have to uh, uh, start with new sets of parameters uh, every time uh, to avoid getting stuck in local minima, even with a sophisticated method. And then how, how many stars do you choose? Right? You choose three, five, ten, a hundred. And we are starting to think about that, and there's a hint of a solution in this paper that uh, we published last year. Close parentheses, wake up again. 
so this is uh, what you get at the end. So it, after you fit the parameters to a single subject, or two subjects in this case, and you project these um, probabilities on, onto the board, uh, what you see in the, in, the <coughs> in the beginning of the game, the model doesn't do particularly well. Right? It's just a little bit clueless about where the person is going to move. But then as the game progresses, it's going to, the, it's going to more and more often predict pretty correctly where the uh, person is going to move. And uh, overall, we achieve about 39% uh, correct, which doesn't sound uh, that impressive, but it's still a lot higher compared to chance. Uh, Creed number three. So I believe in the quantitative comparison of uh, many plausible interpretable models, as opposed to uh, a philosophy that also exists in the, in the field, which is you fit one model, say, oh, yeah, that looks pretty good, and then go home. Um, now, uh, Creed for a Happy Life, that comes with a big footnote, which is, uh, it makes my life very happy, not necessarily my students. Um, but uh, I'm going to show you the results of what, uh, of what Buzz did. So uh, this is where you compare the tree search model with the obvious op no alternative, which is that people don't even build a tree, right? They, do, they just evaluate one step. That's called a, a no tree or a myopic model. So uh, uh, there are some people for which everyone favors a no-tree model, but most people seem to be uh, doing planning. Now, if you do uh, model comparison uh, with more models, so you can compare to models where you lesion parts of uh, your model components, you can add uh, extra ingredients, you can compare to um, AI-type algorithms, such as uh, what Sam mentioned, uh, Monte Carlo tree search. And uh, uh, overall, the message is that if you take away components from the model, it tends to get worse in terms of human fit. If you add components, it doesn't really help. And if you compare to AI algorithms, the naive AI algorithms, uh, it, it's a lot better. So I'm not making any strong claims that this is the very best model, the end all be all, but it's a good enough model that we can do interesting stuff with it uh, afterwards. OK, so this is a, a, a little bit of, uh, about the suffering of my graduate student. So this is how long it actually takes to fit those 24 models, or um, how many, however many th there are now. So in total, CPU time would have been uh, 139 years. So uh, the only reason that he finished his PhD was because of the high-performance computing cluster, right? Uh, which uh, gives you pause about sort of the progress of science. right? If we didn't have that cluster, then there's a certain science that we just couldn't have done. So people ask a lot about like, oh, what are the trees that people seem to be building, right? So uh, in terms of the depth, so how many steps do you, uh, do you think people look ahead? Uh, say number, right? One, two, three, four, five, ten. Two, are you twos, are you threes? Okay, so the, the median is actually three steps ahead in, in, in our model fit. How many moves would you on average consider in a given position? That turns out to be five. So can we validate this model using independent metrics and tasks? So first, uh, we, we look at re response times, right? Because we've fitted the model to moves, we also want to look at response times. So the idea here is that if the model fit builds a bigger tree in a given position, it means it's really uncertain about what's, uh, uh, what is the best move here. And that, that could reflect also what, uh, if you take it literally as a process model, it should reflect the process that the human would go through when deciding on a move. Right, so then the human would be expected to take longer. And by and large, you see that correlation. It's overall like a, a correlation of uh, 0.42, which is, uh, which is decent. Now, uh, what we also do is a time limit manipulation. So we force people to make the move in five seconds, 10 seconds, or uh, uh, 20 seconds. And the infinity point is the previous experiment where we don't have a time limit. And if we had not found a, a monotonic increase in, this, in the estimated tree sizes, something would have been very wrong with our model, and we would have uh, had to go back to the drawing board. But fortunately, we did find that people seem to be building bigger trees uh, when they have more time. Eye movements. So this uh, is from a very old paper in a journal that uh, is, I'm sure, on your regular reading list, uh, Soviet psychology. Uh, nowadays, it's called Eastern European uh, psychology. So in 1966, they already started looking at the role of eye movements in chest position. So uh, they uh, made the case that the uh, fixations would reflect uh, the relationship between different pieces. So the features of the board that are relevant for uh, deciding on your next move. For example, people would lo look a lot at the pawn at d5, the knight at f6, the bishop at g5, because they are in, in tension, right? They would, uh, one, uh, one piece could uh, capture another piece. So we can do something similar here, uh, because uh, we can measure eye movements in each, board, in each position. Uh, here you see an example uh, of a fixation trace with duration scaled by the size of the circle. 
and uh, we convolve that and we uh, turn it into an attentional map. So this is the attentional map that people would have, in the, that this person would have in this position. Now, you can compare that to the model. How can you compare it to the model? Because the decision tree, as it builds the tree, as you saw in the simulation, uh, it also visits uh, squares at different frequencies. Right? So that means that you can just count up those frequencies, uh, the, the, those visits, and you can also get a histogram. So then you can correlate those two histograms. That's pretty much what it comes down to. And overall, that's a high correlation, 0.55. So that's a little bit of independent validation uh, of, of the process um, uh, validity, validity of this model. Now, what can we do with the model? So we can test hypotheses about expertise in planning. So um, anybody plays chess on a regular basis here? OK. Uh, anybody knows what Kasparov, the world champion, played in this position? It's a, it's a completely insane move. Anyone else? Okay, so the uh, Kasparov took the pawn on d4 with his rook, and uh, that, that seems in completely insane because the rook can be immediately captured by the pawn on c5. Uh, it turned out he won after 20 more moves, and he had seen it all in advance. Okay, it was, it's one of the best games, uh, uh, according to many people, ever played. Now, if you look at the, uh, the hypotheses about expertise in the chess literature, it goes way all the way back all the way to Adrian de Groot in 1946, and then Herb Simon, who uh, worked in the 70s and the 80s on um, uh, uh, defending the position that the most important aspect of expertise is improved pattern recognition. Right? Then Simon's student uh, went against his uh, advisor and argued that uh, what's much more important is that skilled chess players search more and deeper. So those are both legitimate hypotheses. In our game, we can look at this because people do seem to increase in, in their playing strength over five sessions. So we bring them five, back five times. Now, using the model, we can fit the model uh, to the moves at e in each session, and then we can try to assess what changes. So we have nine parameters, but I'm going to summarize these parameters to you in terms of these three summary statistics. Uh, evaluation function, the size of the tree, and uh, the feature dropping rate. Right? So uh, you can now raise your hand uh, if you think any of these three uh, change, uh, changes uh, in expertise. Um, so uh, you can vote more than once if you want. So who thinks that experts have a better evaluation function in this game? Who thinks that uh, experts have a better tree size in this, uh, greater tree size in this game? Who thinks improved attention? Okay, uh, it's very mixed uh, audience response here. So tree size seems to increase. Uh, and to, to our knowledge, this is the one of the, f maybe the f even the first model-based demonstration of this in, in any game. Um, then uh, feature drop rate decreases over sessions, so it seems like people have impro improved attention with expertise. Uh, we did not find a, an, a significant uh, difference in the value function quality. Now, I don't want to be too strong on that point because that might very, be, very well be game dependent. Because if you learn chess, it takes much longer to know the rules. It takes much longer to understand what features are relevant in a given board position. So uh, the, uh, the absence of evidence in this game, first of all, it's not uh, evidence of absence in this game. It's also not evidence of absence in any other game. But uh, we find very strong results, very robust results on tree size and feature drop rate. And as it turns out, the feature drop rate, so this attentional factor, seems to be most uh, responsible for the increase in playing strength over the five sessions. So uh, Sam talked about mobile data collection, so I'm happily building on that theme. So we're going to, we, we also took this game to uh, a um, mobile uh, game platform uh, developed by the company called Peak in, in the UK. So what we, we sent them our task specification and the AI opponents, and they developed it into a, an actual game, and they uh, sent us anonymous data. So no money changes hands uh, in, this, in this interaction. This is what it looks like. If you have an iPhone, you can actually download this and, and play this. It looks very different. Uh, it, it looks more fun, and there's scores, and there's sounds, and there's lights, but it's the same game. Uh, so uh, 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 building on what Sam said, there is just a, a little bit more of a trend in uh, collecting uh, data using mobile games. Uh, you can get many more uh, participants. So in Connect Them Up, the, 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 the title that Peak uh, gave to our game, uh, we get 100,000 to a million uh, participants. So that, that uh, in comparison, Amazon uh, Turk would, uh, would pale. Uh, the number of choices per participant, of course, you cannot control that, but you sometimes get very large numbers. Now, this is also a, a, a point that Sam made, which is that you could argue that if people play the game on, on the phone for fun, it's actually more natural behavior than if you bring them in the lab and they can't wait to get out of the lab. Um, now, the, the downside is, of course, that controlled experimental manipulations are a little bit harder, and that uh, really depends on 
uh, how willing your, uh, your partner is, and, and we're working on that. So an impression of these data, so uh, just from one month in, in 2018, we had 431 users, 3.2 million games, and 24 million moves. So this is a similarly sized data set. So uh, this is the histogram of how many games people played. So uh, one thing that you notice is that there are 140,000 people who played this game once and never again. <laughs> That's okay. We still love them. Um, and normally you don't pay attention to the tail, but we're going to pay attention to the tail and then blow up the y-axis and you see that there's still thousands of people who play between 20 and 100 games. And it turns out that there are uh, 3,600 users with at least 100 games just in this one month period. So part of what we did is uh, replicating uh, the lab results. So we found evidence, evidence favoring the planning model. Uh, we replicated the response time correlation. But we also found some new things. So it turns out that uh, after a loss, you change your opening move a li little bit more often. So that's sort of a very basic reinforcement learning type um, uh, mechanism. So you learn from your mistakes. Uh, after a loss, you think a little bit longer. Maybe you're reevaluating your policy. Now, there was some, uh, a surprise here. It was a little bit uh, sad uh, that uh, if you started breaking down response time as a function of move number, so as you go on in a game, our model actually fails. So this is a, a clear failure of the model. Uh, the model, uh, which is in uh, red, and uh, sorry, I should have uh, uh, labeled this better, but it's the, y, the right y-axis. It's the average number of model iterations. It starts out high, and it uh, dips before it increases and then drops. People, they start out a little bit uh, higher at the very first move, but then they uh, start moving very fast, and they gradually slow down. Right? So uh, starting from move 10, you could argue it's, it's decent, but in the opening, our model is a complete failure. And if you just introspect a little bit, you, you understand why. The model is predicting that on an empty board, you build a giant tree because you have no features whatsoever. So it takes a lot of iterations before you actually have features that you uh, can, uh, can allow you to distinguish between moves. Right? Whereas uh, a human, they would just say, OK, it's an empty board. I can't figure this out. Let me just make, make the same move that I made last time. Right? Or let me change it up if I lost last time. Right? So it's much more based on previous experiences uh, if, you, if you introspect. So it would be a retrospective form of decision making in the early game. So uh, retrospective decision making is uh, using past experiences, so long-term memory, to inform current decisions. So retrospective uh, is uh, opposed to prospective, which is these planning models that I uh, described before. Now, uh, some people identify this, uh, this dichotomy between retrospective and prospective with model-free, model-based, habitual, and goal-directed. But uh, yesterday, after talking to Anne Collins uh, for two hours, I decided that this was a very risky proposition. And there's a lot of confusion about the terms. And if you want to know more, pl please talk to her or read her, uh, her paper that is going to come out, uh, come out maybe uh, sometime this year. So uh, I'm going to use the terms retrospective and prospective. So retrospective decision making could uh, in part be based on state repetitions, just like you have seen the same position before, right? And you remember what you did and you remember how, how, how you did. Right? So uh, let's first look at uh, what basis do people have to actually um, um, uh, look at um, state repetition. So the, the, the y-axis is the probability of having already seen the current state as a function of move number, and we also split it up by uh, user expertise. So the darker colors are people who have played more games. And as you can see, uh, the first, second, third, and fourth move, so it goes, uh, the, the, the counting is for both parties, uh, you have um, decent probabilities that you have uh, seen the state before. So you have a, a basis uh, on, in your long-term memory to, to draw from. And now, this is probably not enough, because you see it, it, it quickly drops off around move uh, three or four. And most likely, you have to look at generalized measures of similarity that people would argue, oh, I've seen a similar position in the, in the past. And how can I uh, then draw? Uh, I, I, I can draw from that generalized experience. But uh, defining similarity, especially in a principal way, is, is a really um, is a well-known challenge. And it's a hard challenge. So what you could do if you were to use a retrospective mechanism is that you uh, would use a lookup table for past results. So you're in a given position, uh, you're considering move A, move B, move C. And you remember more or less how many games you've played and how many of wins you've gotten. There are halves because you uh, can have a draw, so that's a, that, that would be a half. Now, to make things even worse, it's not just a retrospective and prospective. 
but it, it all, there could also be a sort of myopic mechanism. So I talked to you about the myopic model, and it could be that people are just looking one step ahead as sort of a really crude approximation for uh, a tree search. So uh, these systems have different advantages and disadvantages. Prospective slow but accurate, retrospective fast but sloppy, and a myopic pr prospective would be fast, but we don't know how accurate it would be. And you can also wonder if these are really distinct systems and maybe we are uh, artificially um, uh, trichotomizing, if that's the word. So uh, assuming for the moment that there are two or three systems, then you have to ask how do you arbitrate? So the, the classic suggestion is that it's based on the uncertainty that's associated with each of the systems and more recent normative ideas, uh, in part by Sam and, and Tom Griffiths and Cezanne Karimati, they have uh, proposed uh, mechanisms that are about uh, arbitration mechanisms that are about the costs and benefits of using either system. And we're just starting to look uh, into this. Other games. So I've talked a lot about four in a row. There exist other games in the world, and this is one of them. So uh, uh, four in a row is adversarial. So you can wonder, uh, does this generalize at all to a single player puzzle game? So if you don't have an opponent. So uh, who has heard of Rush Hour? Okay, it's also a very popular kids game. So uh, the, the, the task is to make this red car escape from this uh, exit marked by an arrow. And you can do so by moving the vertical cars up and down and the uh, horizontal cars left and right. It's similar to what's called the tile puzzle. It's a, a famous problem in computer science. Uh, so uh, we run this experiment on MTurk. Uh, 70 puzzles, people did on average 51, and we had four different difficulty levels. Uh, here you see uh, people's solutions in a puzzle of the lowest difficulty level. So you can, in principle, solve this uh, in six moves. So the distance to go starts at six, that's a black dot, and if you were optimal, you would just go straight down to zero, and uh, some people do. And then there are um, uh, poor participants who take 52 moves to solve a problem that could have been s solved in, in six moves. So uh, needless to say, there's a lot of individual variability here, uh, and it actually uh, it shouldn't be making fun of this participant because these, these are hard, hard puzzles. Now, what are the features here? So we'd love a more principled way of uh, detecting features, but for now we've intuited what would be a, a useful feature representation in this task. So what matters in this uh, game is uh, cars blocking other cars. So what we do is we take the uh, board position and we translate it into a graph structure. So we start with the red car and we ask what are the cars that are blocking the red car from going down the exit. So that would be one car one and car zero. So you draw an arrow from the red car, R, to one and to zero. Then one is blocked by two and five. So you can draw an arrow from one to two and from one to five, etc. Right, so then you can define the level in this graph where uh, the, uh, uh, the level is defined as the number of arrows down from the red car that you need to go reach a particular car. Right, so clearly uh, uh, car number seven is less relevant uh, to the immediate problem than uh, car number one. So it, we define it as having a lower re uh, level in this graph. So what you can look at then is optimal solutions in terms of the different levels of the graph. And if you look at the number of cars at each of these levels, it decreases monotonically, more or less monotonically, as you solve the puzzle. So th this is not a mathematical proof by any means. There's uh, clearly also exceptions, like you see here. But this gives us some hope that this is a decent set of, of heuristics. Now, once we've uh, used these heuristic features, you can build the heuristic value function, and it's si uh, similar to four in a row, where we take the numbers of cars at the different levels, we weight them, we sum them. There's no opponent here. Uh, and then after that, you plug that value function into the tree search, that is exactly the same way that we, we did in, as in four in a row. Right, so in, in rush hour, uh, this is what the tree building uh, looks like. So each principal variation, each sequence of best moves is now a little movie, which you see on the left. And then on the right, you see uh, the, uh, the tree that the, that the algorithm is building. And as you can see, it, it regularly changes its mind because it discovers that as you, as you go deeper into the tree, something that initially seemed promising is no longer that promising. And uh, then you, another move gets um, selected for further expansion. OK, so I want to outline a few areas of, of future work and ongoing work. So uh, I started out uh, talking about uh, AI, and we do want to compare to deep RL networks. Uh, development, neural basis, lesion patients, and some new tasks. So we are training a deep RL network for four in a row. So I did not change my opinion since the beginning of the talk that I don't think this is a good model for human behavior. However, it's still interesting to see what solutions it comes up with and how it is compared to 
uh, to human uh, algorithms. So this is based on alpha zero. The agent chooses moves by uh, using a variant of Monte Carlo tree search. And uh, the neural network that's, uh, uh, that is the, that's key here, it prov provides an estimate of the value function, right? It's instead of having these manually constructed features like we used, uh, it, it learns the values. It also uh, learns the policy and it trains uh, you through self-play. And we expect that this, this will be easier than Go, but it will still take a lot of uh, uh, training games. Uh, we started collaboration with Kate Hartley, also in my department, uh, where we are hoping to see what happens to the parameters in the model as uh, or during childhood and adolescence. So the idea here is that uh, there's previous evidence that uh, uh, kids start out being more retrospective and gradually shift to be being more uh, prospective. However, um, this is not always easy to uh, detect in kids, and uh, we are hoping that four in a row is uh, a, a cleaner paradigm to separate these, uh, these different systems. Now, uh, this is a very uh, ambitious project that uh, Dale, Lee, and I started, and maybe it's maybe too ambitious, but it's with looking at value representation in VMPFC in uh, non-human primates, um, uh, uh, macaques who are uh, playing four in a row. So, of course, you have to train people to play four in a row, uh, train monkeys to play four in a row, and uh, we're still in the middle of that training process. So we started just by having the monkey complete a three in a row, but this is a movie of where the, the monkey is right now. So monkey starts there, moves the joystick, clicks on one of three uh, locations. Uh, so the locations are marked by these open circles, and uh, after the first choice, a new set of three locations uh, appears, and then the, the monkey starts to complete uh, them to, to four in a row. Now, gradually, we want to uh, make this more difficult by having opponents move add pieces in between and um, having the opponent make smarter and smarter moves uh, uh, over the course of training. But this is uh, ho hopeful. This, this gives us hope that we can um, train monkeys to do this. And the hypotheses here are that the value function that our tree search model is using would be represented in, in VMPFC just like it is in simpler behavior economics tasks. Right? And the even stronger hypothesis is that you can trace the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the time course of value while the monkey is considering uh, his next move. As it because the, uh, the options change, uh, the values of the different options change all the time. Uh, we do something very similar in uh, uh, humans in fMRI. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Nathaniel Dahl's lab. So here we give people a position and we ask them to choose the best move. So this is after they have practiced the game outside of the scanner. Then uh, they choose the best move and then they leave the scanner and they have to play a game using the chosen move and they get rewarded for a, uh, for a win against the computer uh, uh, in, in, uh, as the game plays out. Uh, now, what's important in fMRI is that people actually take a sufficiently long time. So that it's the time, time course of fMRI um, can match that. Uh, so uh, people take, uh, on average, about 10 seconds to move, which is, which is sufficient. And it's actually uh, helpful here that this is a game that requires quite a bit of deliberation, so that people don't have a tendency to make a move in, in one or two seconds. And we started doing an, uh, an analysis where we put in the heuristic value from the model uh, uh, and, uh, with weights fitted to separate games uh, as a regressor, and we have also nuisance regressors uh, that have to do with motion, for example. And we already see uh, activation in uh, uh, prefrontal cortex and in, uh, in the basal ganglia. So uh, the next step is then to also try to look at the, uh, at the dynamics for, uh, of, these, of this value representation. Uh, we're taking this uh, to uh, patients as well. We started the collaboration with Sanjay Manohar in Oxford. So he has uh, patients who uh, had aneurysms um, in an, um, in a um, co connecting artery in the pre prefrontal cortex, and they uh, are high functioning. They often uh, have very few clinical deficits. Sometimes they come in with uh, headaches, um, but they, there's anecdotal evidence that they have problems, problems with long-term planning. So uh, Sanjay has tried the two-step task, the Nathaniel Adele's two-step task, but those results were inconclusive. And again, we're hoping here that the, that the four in a row task can better bring out um, deficits in planning. Now, uh, the final direction that we're going is combining planning with social inference. So uh, this is uh, inference about other people's strategies, knowledge, and goals. 
So this is a road construction task. It's inspired by the traveling salesperson problem. Uh, you're playing with a partner. You control the green budget. Your partner controls the blue budget. And you're using the budget to connect cities. You get rewarded for the total number of cities that you and your partner connect. So not just do you have to take into account your own policy, but you also have to take into account your op op where your, uh, your partner is going. Otherwise, you end up going to the same part of the map, and that's, that's not efficient. So uh, here's a variant where we call this Canadian traveler task. This, we didn't uh, invent that term. It's from computer science. It's like the traveling salesman problem where you have to navigate from A to B. But uh, along the way, a uh, road segment can be randomly closed. Apparently, in Canada, that happens uh, by snow falling on the road. Uh, so then your job here is to help the sheep navigate this space. So you can click anywhere on the grid to reveal the status of the road to the sheep. And the sheep has its own policy to then navigate to the, to the flag. And if you uh, choose your, uh, uh, your samples efficiently, you, you can be, uh, make, make life easier for the sheep. Right now, the sheep is a computer sheep. Um, <laughs> all right, so you can also have a dead end because the closures are de uh, determined uh, uh, independently. Uh, so uh, you, then you get rewarded for discovering quickly that th there is no solution. And to make it more interesting, we can also have situations where you have multiple goals, so you don't only have to do inference about policies, uh, but also about uh, goals. So the, the sheep is going to indicate through its moves where, where it's going. Uh, zombie escape task, last task I want to talk about. So this, uh, uh, this is pretty uh, getting ecologically raw, if you, if you will. So this is uh, uh, your two uh, humans uh, controlling the dots on the left. And in the, in the middle, you have uh, a zombie who's trying to eat, bo eat both of you. Both of you. Uh, so your goal is for one of you to make it to the red line. And this, this movie has a very sad ending. <laughs> uh, so you have to do something a little bit smarter than that. So uh, you have to... Um, distract the zombie. The zombie is going to the one who's closest to you. So, oh, uh, that was a nice try, but uh, the zombie first eats the one who's uh, the black dot, and then uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very emotional. Um, so you can actually win this game by timing it right. So you wait until the zombie is closest to you, and then you uh, distract uh, the zombie, and then the, your, your friend makes it to the other side. You can just make this more social by giving the person who makes it to the other side uh, a bonus for making it, so then it becomes uh, altruism versus selfishness. Uh, and what you can do is you can do fun stuff like varying the zombie policy. So this is a slightly smarter zombie who goes to uh, the agent who's closest to the goal. So you try the same strategy, it fails now because the zombie switches uh, directions. Any idea how to win against this zombie? Well, it's possible by, by alternating who is closest to the goal. So what we're interested in here is how people learn to collaborate in a complex planning task. Because if we don't tell people this strategy, are they ever going to figure it out? Uh, what is the role of communication? What if I allow them to communicate about it? And uh, yeah, you, you, you win in this. OK. Oh, <laughs> I'm not done yet. This is, uh, was just my student controlling both agents. <laughs> um, all right, so I hope I convince you that uh, human planning in large state space is interesting, neglecting cognitive science, and amenable to rigorous modeling. So I actually think it's, 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 it's the beginnings of what could be a complete field. So it has questions that are related to RL systems, inference, learning, generalization, attention, short-term memory, long-term memory, uh, and all these collaborations that we started, they uh, sort of reflect uh, that breadth. Uh, also, the methods that you might be, uh, like to use, uh, you, can, you can find them in, in these kinds of tasks. Small data, big data, cognitive models, deep RL models, physiology, fMRI, development, patients. So pretty much this talk is an invitation for you to join this field. So to uh, think of your own task, uh, um, bl do, uh, think about human cognition, uh, characterizing the uh, details of human cognition. We'd love to get your feedback on these tasks, on the models that we have, other tasks that might be suitable, uh, and feel free to use any of our tasks for, for your own purposes. These are the people uh, who worked on this, both in my lab, uh, formerly in my lab, and, and collaborators. Thanks to the funding sources, and thanks uh, for listening. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Hi. Um, I was sort of wondering where did the hippocampus disappear in the model-based uh, planning? Yeah, so uh, uh, we definitely want to work in the hippocampus as well. It's just that the, the interest of our main collaborators were in prefrontal cortex. So Dale Lee has, for as far as I know, only uh, studied uh, prefrontal cortex uh, in, in great detail. 
uh, in these kinds of tasks. So uh, if somebody else wants to look in, in, in Hippocampus, in, maybe in rodents, maybe we, we have to bring in rodents there and teach them four in a row, it would be super, super helpful. And we would be super happy about that, yeah. Hi. Speaking of yeah. hippocampally Hi. compatible models and models that actually better fit human behavior, um, there, there, it seems like you maintain a dichotomy between retrospective and prospective in the RL framework, whereas there are intermediate models that have abstracted multi-step cached memories where the memory is predictive in nature. Yeah. And hippocampus and like multi-scale representations do have a yeah. role in that. I yeah, wonder so what you think of that, whether you're pursuing that in the future, whether it's a... Yeah, yeah so we've definitely been thinking about that class of models. So we're thinking about successor representation, options frameworks, and amortization. And uh, right now, we are still struggling to apply those to uh, our task. Uh, for example, uh, as, uh, as far as you know, successor representation works best if you have multiple experiences with the same state and you can uh, learn these, uh, these uh, state matrices, these state transition matrices. And uh, we ha I don't know exactly how that is going to work if uh, you, you m see most states for this first time uh, every time. Right? Maybe so the options transfer framework might help here? If you yeah, we, uh, I'd love to have that conversation. Yeah, thank you. I'm curious whether you've explored models where uh, the model's choice depends on whether or not the opponent's uh, decision actually lined up with the predictions based on the tree search. Ah. So, so at least, you know, heuristically, if I'm playing a game, the opponent makes a move that I don't expect. Yeah. I spend a lot longer wondering what they did and trying to figure out if there's a better move that I didn't see last time. Uh, great suggestion. We, we haven't looked at that. Uh, in the monkey project, we are uh, th uh, thinking of looking at surprise. So pretty much the, uh, the probability, uh, low probability of the, of the opponent's move uh, under the current model and looking at uh, neural correlates of, of surprise. Thank yeah. you. So we have time for one more quick question. All right, cool. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for doing something really courageous, namely taking human intuition uh, serious uh, in terms of scientific value. I played Black Fauna Row a lot with my sisters growing up. And one of the reasons why I think people improve a lot on, uh, particularly on the oversight problem, like the overlooked probability that you have, is mostly because it's socially painful to, to see that you, like, you know, not miss like a deadlock situation where you can't do stuff, but where you overlooked an obvious way in which your opponent just won. So it's painful. Uh, that's one thing I wanted to mention. And the, the, the broader question, I guess, is um, in all of these cases, right, there's a lot of value to asking people why they made a certain move. So I, I wonder how many of your hypotheses you derive from asking people why did you make that losing move? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you for sharing your emotional tribulations in your childhood. <laughs> uh, and second, uh, we, we, we tried uh, asking people why they made certain moves, and their answers were not very informative. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's, let's thank Ouija again. OK. We've got a coffee break now, and we reconvene at 4.15.
action. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Adam Calhoun, and I'm gonna tell you today about work that's been done jointly with Ben Cowley. So we're all here because we'd like to understand how the nervous system functions, right? And we'd like to understand things like how sensory information is transformed into behavior. So a very common approach, particularly cosine this year, has been to train neural networks on some tasks, such as object identification. In this example here, a network is presented with some image, and the network has to correctly identify this uh, dog. Uh, what we then do is we take these same images, present them to a brain, uh, and then compare gross features of the model's activity with how the brain is doing the same task. But what's been missing is that we often care very deeply about what specific neurons or specific neuron classes are doing. And what we really want is a one-to-one -one mapping between neurons in the brain and neurons in the model. So the approach that we're gonna propose today is that what we should do is we should perturb the system, for instance, by silencing classes of neurons. And then what we should do is that when we train the model, we should perturb it in the same way. For instance, we could set the neurons in the model to zero, uh, which is akin to silencing them. To make these kind of comparisons, we're gonna use Drosophila for two reasons. One is that they have extensive genetic tools that allow us to precisely manipulate the neural circuitry. And the other is that they have rich, highly quantifiable behaviors. So let me tell you briefly about the nervous system. Uh, Drosophila has two large optic lobes, which are analogous to the retina. Just like the retina, these optic lobes have, uh, uh, have neurons that tile the visual field. They have many layers of these, and if I were to model this in a neural network, I would model it like a series of convolutions. Now, of the neurons that project from the eye into the brain, there's a set in which, uh, in most cases, they lose their retinotopy, but they maintain their feature selectivity, so they can roughly be thought of as feature detectors. These neurons provide a bottleneck between the eye and the brain, and if I were to model it, I would probably model it as a vector, which I'm showing here. Then these neurons, uh, the visual information from these neurons is read out, uh, and the central brain ends up using this information to produce behavior. Uh, so thanks to Genalia, we have access to genetic lines that allow us to precisely target different classes of these projection neurons. So this is one image of one class of the lines we could use. This is another image. And in some, we have uh, more than 20 uh, classes of these visual neurons that we could look at one at a time. So these neurons are all mapped, but we actually currently know very little about them. We're pretty sure that they're feature detectors, uh, but we don't know what features they detect, generally, and we generally don't know how they're involved in behavior. So, uh, from previous work, we know that one behavior that's strongly visually modulated is courtship. So this is a video of Drosophila courtship, where the male's in blue, the female's in red, uh, and the male consistently orients towards the female and then moves towards her, and as he moves towards her, he often extends his wing and vibrates it to produce a song. If the song is good enough, the female allows him to mate. Uh, and this, this decision to make song uh, is visually guided. So what the male needs to do is he needs to use certain features of the female in order to produce his behavior, but we don't really know which features. So this rich and complex visually guided behavior is perfect for studying the role of these projection neurons. Uh, the first thing we'd wanna do is to identify which of these projection neurons contribute to behavior. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna take those uh, genetic lines to silence classes of neurons one at a time. Uh, and what we're gonna do is then uh, allow the male to court the female and just look to see if the behavior changes. So in this instance, we're just gonna look at the amount of song he produces, and when we silence this particular class of neurons, you see that he produces much more song than control. So he's at doubling the uh, amount of song the control produces. Now if we went through and looked at uh, each of the lines in turn, each of these classes in turn, we see that in fact the vast majority of these neurons contributes to behavior. If I were to show you other aspects of the courtship behavior, such as his ability to orient towards a female or to chase after her, uh, it, would, it appears that he's using the full complement of these visual neurons to produce his courtship behavior. So that's great, but the problem is we don't really have a way to understand what each of these neurons contributes to behavior when all of them do. Uh, so to determine the role of these neurons, we're gonna do two things. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna reconstruct the visual input of the male fly from the observed 2D trajectories. So we're gonna take is this video playing? Yeah. We're gonna take uh, the trajectories, uh, we're gonna figure out what the fly is seeing, and we're gonna render it in a 3D model, which is what I'm showing below. So that should be what the male is observing uh, moment to moment about the female. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this reconstructed visual input, 
We're going to pass it into that vision network, which is going to be sent into the uh, projection neuron vector, which has as many variables as we have uh, projection neuron channels in the actual brain. And this is going to be read out by a dense decision network, which is going to be used to predict the fly's behavior. So we're going to predict his velocity, his orientation as he uh, tracks the female, and whether he produces song. And we're going to also provide this decision network with inputs over multiple time lags so that it has access to temporal information. So now that we have our deep network model of the uh, brain, or of the behavior, and now that we have the actual biological system, we're going to do what I suggested before, which is try to identify one-to-one -one mapping between these classes of neurons in the brain and the neurons in uh, the vector. And we're going to do this, like I suggested, where we're going to take our data where we silence these uh, classes of visual neurons, and then when we're training the model, we're going to set that, uh, that element of the vector to zero. What this should mean is that that element of the vector should only contain information and representations that are unique to that class of neurons. So once we train this model, we can start making predictions with it. Uh, one prediction that we can make with it is we can start trying to predict seamless tuning of the projection neurons. Uh, so here's an example of a tuning curve. Uh, and it's a tuning curve is a function of stimulus size. And for this model neuron, on the x-axis, we have increasing stimulus size. On the y-axis, we have the activity of these neurons. And what I hope you see is that this neuron appears to be selective for small stimuli. Now what we can do is we can do imaging of the actual biological neuron and ask whether it also shows similar stimulus tuning. So this is what I'm show below, uh, where we've taken a uh, fly, we've presented uh, stimuli of increasing size, and then we've performed calcium imaging uh, of these neurons in the brain. And what you can see is that this, so on the x-axis we also have these stimuli of increasing size. And what I hope you see is that this neuron uh, turns out to actually be tuned for small stimuli. So this model made a prediction. We performed an experiment and found that this model held. And this gives us a lot of confidence the model is able to accurately represent what these neurons are doing. Now, receptive fields are just a crude approximation of the complex response of these neurons. Uh, so we're going to do something fun since we have this deep network. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our network, we're going to remove the decision network, and we're just going to replace it with a generator network that we're going to train to reconstruct the decoded, to reconstruct the input that's presented to the model. So that's what I'm showing here. Uh, on the top, uh, we have the input to the model. On the bottom, we have the decoded input. And what I hope you see is it does a good job of reconstructing uh, what the model is uh, being presented with just from that uh, activity of the projection neurons. So this lets us do something fun. It lets us take this model and it lets us silence some of the neurons and just ask how the representation changes. What does the model no longer have access to? Uh, so now we can, oh, yeah. Uh, so now we can look at the reconstruction. And I hope you see it's very different. I hope you see that uh, when you silence this neuron, uh, you start losing this complex mixture of orientation and angular information. And I think that by using this pixelized information, we get a better and more complex understanding of what this neuron's doing. So because our model fits a full sensory motor transformation, we can also ask how neurons relate to behavior. Uh, so one thing we can do is we can look at the uh, activity in the model, and we can ask, as this model's activity changes, how does the behavior change? Uh, in this case, uh, you can see as the model neuron's activity increases, which is on the x-axis, uh, he produces more song. So this is a prediction. We haven't tested it yet. But if we think our model can predict behavior, we should be able to use it to model and or we should be able to use this model to sculpt and control the behavior. And if we can do that, that's another strong prediction that validates the model. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to uh, find stimuli, find sequences of stimuli, which the model predicts should maximize some feature of the behavior. So we're going to try to maximize the fly's forward velocity and make him move faster. And so we might search for the stimuli and find stimuli that look something like this. Then we might do the same thing and try to find stimuli that minimize some aspect of the fly's behavior. And then we might do this and try to find uh, stimuli that look like this. And the experiment we're going to do is we're going to put flies in virtual reality where they're surrounded by a screen uh, on which we can present these stimuli. And the fly's just going to be on a floating ball allowed to walk fictively around. Um, and we're going to activate courtship neurons to put them in the courtship mode. And the stimuli that we present look like this. Um, I assume most of you don't spend a lot of time staring at fly courtship, but let me just tell you, this is a very non-naturalistic stimuli. Uh, they don't really jump around blindly like this. Um, but we can go ask, how does behavior actually change? So flies start off walking some general speed. And then we present a stimuli that should make the fly move faster. And what we see is that the fly does start moving faster. Then what we can do is present stimuli that the model thinks should make the fly move slower. And what we see is the fly does start moving slower. 
So this suggests that we're really capturing aspects of the fly's uh, sensory motor transformation on a pixel level. So now what we can do in the future is we can go in and optimize for other behavioral outputs whose stimuli is less well known about, such as what produces song. Uh, and we can in the future use this model to really push the behavior into new regimes. So uh, since this is a short talk, I didn't have time to emphasize some other aspects of the model that I think are really important, such as that this is a framework that allows us a way to talk about neural contribution to behavior when uh, neural activity is distributed, which it often is, um, and that this will allow us to understand how population level computations arise from the feature selectivity of individual units, which I think is a very fundamental question in neuroscience. So what I've shown you today is that we have a way to train task-based models that allows us to map biological neurons onto these model neurons. Uh, that we can infer unobserved neural activity from behavioral data. And I want to emphasize how cool I think this is, which is that we didn't you know, enforce anything about the, about the neural behavior aside from the fact that we sometimes set it to zero. And even though we did that, we're still able to predict uh, activity of these neurons just from behavior. Um, and that we can use this network to synthesize stimuli that are able to control the behavior of this fly. So I'd like to thank my collaborators. As I said, uh, all this work was done jointly with Ben Cowley, who's a postdoc in Jonathan Pillow's lab. Jonathan is currently on sabbatical in Paris, so he couldn't make it. Uh, I'm a postdoc in Mala Murthy's lab. I'd also like to uh, thank Nevada Rengarajan and Kate Kaplan, uh, as well as Max Turner, who helped contribute data to this uh, presentation, as well as my funding sources. And thank you for listening to my talk. Thanks, Adam. I think we have time for a few questions. Hi. Um, can you devise adversarial attacks on the fly brain? Uh, yes, uh, we hope to. Uh, so that was actually the original point of this project that we started to do. Um, and then we thought, well, maybe we should try to just look at the behavior itself. Um, so our goal in the future is to try to, you know, not, if not do adversarial attacks, take an approach like Jim DiCarlo, where we do this adaptive stimulus selection and try to produce stimuli that really drive the, the fly in weird ways, even if the uh, stimuli are kind of not representative of anything of the actual see. And uh, my second question is about uh, training the model when you're uh, lesioning the, the bottleneck, if mm -hmm. you will, of 22 neurons, that vector. Um, how is it that the, um, the training procedure doesn't take advantage of the rest of that vector to transmit the information that you're manually setting to zero? So um, when you, it has to do with the fact that biologically we're silencing these neurons. So the animal who's doing the sensory motor transformation isn't using some set of stimulus, right? So he's not maybe using distance information to produce his behavior. Um, so everything about the behavior, everything about sensory motor transformation should be pushed onto those other neurons, uh, except when you're now training it on uh, this other data where we've inactivated it. And so that neuron, some aspect of it that maybe was pushed onto it that it shouldn't have is now pushed onto the other ones and it kind of gets pushed around. That's kind of our intuition of what's happening, if that makes sense. Um, thank you for the great talk. So I was just wondering if there's a way to, uh, you know, find this kind of optimal stimulus for uh, generating some, you know, or like optimizing some, some cost function in a way that is like more uh, kind of realistic or like, you know, given some sort of, sort of constraints that the kind of scenes that you're showing are, are more natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I certainly think we can. I think we can you know, regularize or add some constraints. Uh, we've talked about that, but we haven't really thought about how to do it deeply. I would suggest talking to Ben Cowley, who's, who's kind of more of an expert on this field. Thank you. I'm sorry. Hi, I'm wondering what happens if you close the loop, meaning the generated images, now you feed them back in from the other side. Yeah, uh, so again, that's our plan in the future. Uh, we think it'll allow us to uh, both get a better idea of what's going on and generate these weird stimuli that should give us a better handle on like what's really going on in the system. Um, we don't know yet, honestly. Yes. Hello, thank you. Um, it, it's, uh, your model is a purely feed for the network, right? Right. And uh, the behavior, it looks like some time dependent uh, trajectory. It's, yes. Is it uh, surprising that he does such a good work in explaining it? Uh, yes. Um, so I, work I've done in the past has shown that uh, there's a lot of state dependence in the animal's behavior. Um, and so certainly in the future, we might be interested in adding kind of recurrent networks in this. 
Um, you know, the linear approach does a good job at picking up on some aspects of behavior, and I suspect that for the most part, the, uh, the visual processing is, is roughly uh, fee-forward, roughly, um, except for some, some recurrence from like mo uh, motion and such. Um, but uh, I'm sure we could capture more of the information if we added in recurrent neural networks. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Adam. Thanks. Uh, our last talk of the day is Matt Parrich talking about multi-region network models of brain-wide interactions during adaptive and maladaptive state transitions. Thanks. So I'm going to tell you today about our work using recurrent neural network models to infer brain-wide interactions between single cells. So let's say you want to understand some neural circuit. Experimentally, you can go in and you can record the activity of these neurons. So drive in an electrode, get some action potentials, and ask your animal to produce some behavior. With modern methods, of course, you can get a lot of these neurons at once. So this lets us start to study these population-wide distributed dynamics. And commonly how this is viewed is that you have the state space where each axis of the space represents the activity of one of these neurons. And when you ask the animal to produce a behavior, the activity traces out some trajectory through this state space. And empirically, what we often find is that you don't explore the full possible range of neural states. Instead, you're confined to this lower dimensional subspace, which we call the neural manifold. And this has been seen in many brain areas by many labs and different model organisms, and it seems to be this almost ubiquitous feature of population activity, this sort of reduced dimensionality. And empirically, we can estimate this using dimensionality reduction. In this cartoon example, we can run PCA and find two axes that define this plane. And what this basically finds is this kind of set of dimensions that captures covariance across this population. So it's somehow in the distributed connectivity, there is a way that makes these neurons covary with each other. But the output of each neuron that we can record with this type of experimental methods is some function of its inputs. And these inputs are actually very hard to get experimentally. And so what we want to understand is how these manifolds and how the activities in these manifolds generate behavior. But these manifolds are being shaped by these common inputs across this population, and we don't have access to this. And this becomes particularly important whenever we would try to study interactions between brain regions. Rather than just looking at one little local recurrent population, we want to look at its interactions with some other brain region. And here it becomes a bit problematic just because we don't know whether this covariation because of actual uh, connections or information exchange or common inputs, and we certainly don't know the directionality necessarily between these interactions. So there's been some work by myself and others in recent years, which is quite interesting, looking at these types of communication between regions. But again, because we don't know the directionality, it's a little unclear, and even worse, if we think about trying to study something like depression, some brain-wide network, how do you scale this? If you're looking at all the pairwise combinations between regions, you really hit this combinatorial problem quite quickly. So what we need is some method that can estimate for each cell the inputs both from within and between brain regions that can determine the actual direction of interaction and account for common inputs such that you can say, ah, this cell is being driven by these cells in this way. And lastly, this has to scale to very large data sets and many brain regions. So what we're, our approach is going to be to use recurrent neural network models of the brain to infer this type of interaction. And to develop this technique, we're using data sets from a larval zebrafish. So this is a collaboration with Carl Dizerot's lab at Stanford. And in the paradigm they have, it's a behavioral challenge where the fish is stressed to induce behavioral state changes. So how this looks in the experiment is that the fish swims in a tank during this baseline period. And then they induce these mild, inescapable electric shocks that persist throughout this experiment. And at first, what you can see on this plot, which is the tail speed as a function of time, in these shocked fish in blue, there's an increase in their tail speed. So they start whipping their tails to escape the shock compared to the controls in black. But in this week, what we call the active coping strategy. So they're trying to escape uh, from this stimulus. But because it is inescapable, as this persists, we actually see a change in the fish's response, where the fish decreases relative to controls and slows down its movements. And this is what we call a passive coping strategy. It's sort of analogous to a learned helplessness state in depression. 
So what's interesting here is that we have sort of the same stressful stimulus, yet at different times, two very distinct behavior responses. And we want to understand is what's happening in the brain that guides this transition between these behavioral states. So there was a paper published last year in Cell on this work, and just for the sake of time, I'll reduce it to the main finding, is that there are two brain regions that are really critically involved in this. And so to study these brain regions, we use nucleus localized uh, GCAMP6. We can get whole brain uh, single cell recordings. And this video is from an example fish sort of showing what this data looks like. And when you look at this habenula activity for these cells, what you see as a function of time here, where zero represents when the shocks begin, we're looking at the change in fluorescence of these, of these habenula cells. And in the shocked case in blue, you can see that early on when the fish is actively coping, you can see some response. Seems like it might be a bit transient. And then later on, as the fish goes into this passive state, you can see this ramping of activity that continues and persists. In the raffae, on the other hand, we see something quite different where you see this gradual suppression of activity. So there's kind of an, an increase in habenula and this sort of a inhibition of raffae simultaneously. And through many clever experiments in this paper, they were to show that these two regions interact with each other to drive this behavioral state, and they're very critically and causally involved in this behavioral state transition from active to passive coping. So if we want to look at this population activity in sort of this manifold way I introduced earlier, what we do is do PCA on all these habenula neurons, and here's data from one example fish, where we're looking at the trajectory of habenula activity for the first three principal components throughout this experiment and each dot represents the time of one of these shocks. And I'm coloring them from the earliest shocks in red, where the fish is actively coping, to the last shocks in blue, where the fish is passively coping. And you can see that it traces out this trajectory through the space. And what's interesting about this is that a lot of this type of work is done in you know, reaching or decision making, and these trials that last on a scale of seconds. Here, this is the evolution of habenula activity over tens of minutes. So this is a really long time scale uh, trajectory. In the raffae, we already see something quite different immediately, which instead of this single sort of meandering through space, you see an immediate response in the activity whenever the shocks turn on. So where there's no dots is this baseline period. And where the fish receives a, so a shock, the raffae activity changes. And then you see this drift through the space, which could account for the inhibition of activity. And again, from the experiments in the last paper, we know that these two regions are interacting. And this is somehow driving this active to passive transition. But we don't understand exactly how are these very region-specific distinct dynamics interacting to drive this. So our approach is to use recurrent neural network models. So you can imagine if you build one neural network that models a single brain region, you could build another one that models a different brain region. We're just doing this for every region and sort of linking them all up. So we have this big multi-region network models. And they're trained to recapitulate the activity of the experiment directly. So if we record 10,000 cells from the brain, we have a 10,000 node network, and the target function throughout the training is for each one of those cells to reproduce the activity, the calcium activity, from one of the experimental cells. And this is just trained iteratively through recursive least squares. There's lots of published work on this subject. And what's nice is at the end, you get this kind of matrix that is governing the interactions between this. And this is the matrix of the weights between all the RNN nodes. So as an example, what one of these networks look like so I'm going to do the two regions I mentioned before, habenula and raffae, and then add in a third region, the telencephalon, which is this you know, many, many cell region that's involved in a lot of processes, and it can let us help to account for these common inputs, we hope. So after training, we find that these networks can reproduce the data very well. So on the left is the original state space plot I showed you a couple slides ago, and on the right is the actual networks of the model. So if I just take out the habenular activity and do the state space analysis again on that model, we can see that it reproduces the activity very well. So, okay, we have this modeled brain which reproduces the data. Why do we do this? Okay, what we get is something that you can't really get access to from the experimental data alone, which is this connectivity matrix, which we call J. And you can think of this as, for a given row, which is the postsynaptic cell, it's the weights of all of the possible presynaptic cells that might be feeding information to it. And if you, here where it's a cartoon, we're ordering it by brain region, so if you imagine on the upper left, that's kind of a within brain region and along the diagonal, and if you imagine the off diagonal, this is kind of be a between brain region interaction. So from this, we can get some very useful things. So first is that from these submatrices, we can get this directed interaction strength between and within brain regions. So if you imagine this block matrix on the diagonal or off the diagonal, and it's directed because if we take the upper right, this is the same brain regions that are on the lower left, but the directionality is reversed there. So we can get this directed uh, flow of information. 
So Kanika has a talk at the workshops where she'll be going into our analysis of these matrices and how this can underlie the behavioral state transition. And for the sake of time today, I'm just gonna focus on this other thing we can get from these RNN models, which is an estimate of the currents driving each postsynaptic cell. So if you imagine taking one of these rows, you can basically reconstruct the activity of that postsynaptic cell as a weighted sum of the activity of the presynaptic cells. And of course, that's how we get the model up in the top right that reproduces the original data. But we can also pull this out into the submatrices. So if you wanna know the currents driving a habenula cell from habenula, you can just take the upper left submatrix there and sum across only those indices. And again, for the between region as well. So how does this look? What I'm gonna show here is the currents from the habenula that are being driven by other habenular neurons. So basically taking the weighted sum of this upper left uh, quadrant. And what you see is some distinct pattern of excitation and inhibition. This is sorted here just by the time of peak activity. And this is just some chunk of time throughout this behavioral challenge paradigm. So then we can also do this for the other submatrices. So now we're looking at the same 2,000 habenular neurons, except it's the distinct components of these currents that are driving it from the telencephalon or from the raphe. And if you sum all these together, of course, you reconstruct the full habenular activity that we see in the model. But what you get from this view is this sort of breakdown into, of the yeah, full activity into its constituent currents that are driving it. So instead of this manifold across the full population that you see in the lower left, I'm gonna define a new space where each axis represents the dynamics of one of these input current sources. So the raphe in green, the habenula in orange, and the telencephalon in purple. And whenever you do PCA and project these dynamics here, something very striking pops out immediately, is that if you look at these early shocks with the red dots, there's lots of dynamics along this raphe axis specifically, and then later you see this ramping of activity with the blue shocks in the other axes. And this becomes more clear if you look at this as a function of time. So here again, the raphe is in green, and I'm overlaying this black trace, which is kind of the, temp like the amount of tail whips the fish is giving. So it's kind of a readout of whether they're active or passive. And you can see early on, whenever the fish is moving his tail a lot, there's a lot of raphe activity really driving habenula, and not so much in the, the interhabenula interactions or in the telencephalon. And then as the fish becomes passive, you see this distinct ramping of activity from these other current sources. And this isn't just an effect of the function of time, so if we look at a control fish, where we record for the same duration, but we don't give the shocks, you see some dynamics between the three current sources, but not a clear separation in the same way. This is one example fish. If we take a co our cohort of five and average across, we see a pretty robust and consistent effect emerging, where these early responses is in fact driven by this raphe currents during the act of coping, and then as the fish becomes passive, we see these other current sources increasing. And this is really interesting because it's, it's kind of revealing that there's actually two distinct time scales at play, two different types of signaling. So if you look at this full population activity, you could see this early response during active and this ramping during passive. It turns out this is actually within the same population of neurons driven by two completely different sources, one coming from the raphe and one coming from within uh, the other brain regions. So it's, it's we think a really cool and powerful technique to sort of begin to interpret these brain-wide interactions that might be governing these more complex behaviors. So from this RNN, we can get these types of current inputs reliably. We can know the direction of these interactions. Uh, and of course, we can scale this to as many neurons or brain regions as we want. So I just showed a simple example of three brain regions for the sake of time. Uh, we're scaling this up to the whole brain recordings with tens of regions, and then we're gonna begin to look more deeply at these principles. So just to acknowledge, uh, Kanika has given this talk at the workshop, which you should definitely come to because it's great work. I'm a little biased. Uh, but I mostly want to thank collaborators. Uh, so of course, Kanika and Carl for the mentorship. The experiments were done by Tyler and Aaron in Carl's lab. And then Jean and Camille did a lot of work with the training and the analysis of these RNNs. So thanks. Thanks, Matt. I think we have time for one question. Hi, great talk. Um, so I noticed that the inputs from the telencephalon to the habenula looked like they were negatively weighted yeah. at a time when the recurrent connections were positively weighted. So I'm just wondering, given that you know the anatomy and you might know that those projections are excitatory and you might know where there are GABAergic cells, would it be possible to implement something like this where the cells are either excitatory or inhibitory? 
Yeah, we're thinking about ways we can maybe add constraints to the training that could capture these types of known anatomical effects. Right now, we're just black boxing it, just say reproduce the data. What we can do already is break down this matrix by whether the inferred directed interaction is excitatory or inhibitory. And this is re really a next step for us. We just haven't done it to date. Last question. Hi. Um, have you done any perturbation experiments to validate the inferred connection matrix? And my second yeah. question is, um, have, you, have you compared your connection matrix to the noise correlation matrix? Uh, we have not compared for the second question. We have not done that comparison yet. Uh, that's a good idea. For the first question, so we do not, we have not done, done this analysis yet, but from the original experiments, we do have sort of causal manipulations from optogenetic activation or silencing of brain areas. And one thing we're very interested in doing is seeing the effect of that on these interaction matrices and whether, you know, what you find without optogenetics can predict what you see with the optogenetics and this type of thing. Thanks so much. Let's thank Matt and all the rest thank of the you. speakers.